Hello, and welcome to Virtual Investor Conferences. My name is Matt Leteplo, and on behalf of OTC Markets, as well as our co-host Skyline Corporate Communications Group, we're very pleased you have joined us for our next live presentation from Exco Technologies Limited. Before I introduce our speaker, a few points to note. Please submit your questions in the question box to the left of the slides. If you are interested in scheduling a meeting with Exco Technologies, please click on the Meetings tab found on the left navigation bar. You will be able to view the company's availability and submit a meeting request. On a final note, all of today's presentations will be recorded and available for 24-7 replay. At this point, I am very pleased to welcome Darren Kirk, President and CEO, and Matthew Posno, Chief Financial Officer of Exco Technologies Limited, which trades on the OTCQX best market under the symbol EXCOF and on the TSX under the symbol XTC. Welcome, Darren and Matthew. Great. Thank you, Matthew. And good morning, everyone. Uh, we're very pleased to be here today to present our story at the virtual investor conferences. Uh, I'm Darren Kirk, President and CEO of Exco. Uh, I'll go through an operations overview before I, uh, <clears throat> before Matthew takes over to discuss the financial highlights of Exco, and then we'll take uh, any questions that you may have. Uh, you'll just note here on page two, a cautionary statement, and I won't re read the uh, the content, but they do apply to the discussion today. So Exco Technologies is a small cap um, company uh, primarily focused on providing tooling and solutions to the automotive uh, end markets, but we do um, have significant exposure to broad industrial end markets globally as well. Uh, we go to market uh, through two reporting segments and those reporting segments we call casting extrusion where we're providing tooling for the um, light metal space. And that is primarily for extrusion and high pressure die cast uh, end markets. And we also have a reporting segment that we call automotive solutions. And here we're providing interior trim and components and solutions uh, for the uh, automotive space. We do have a very strong growth profile and this pro growth profile is increasingly being driven by the rapid adoption of electric vehicles, but also broader sustainable environmental sustainability trends. And we'll get into some of those dynamics in the next few slides. Uh, we do have leading market positions in all of our businesses, and we have over 65 years of operating history. One um, recent aspect to note is we did close on our acquisition of Halix extrusion dies uh, at the beginning of May of this year. Halix is the second largest manufacturer of extrusion dies in the European markets. And again, we'll touch on that in the next few slides. Uh, we have a global footprint. We have 20 operating manufacturing plants across nine countries and about 5,000 employees. Uh, globally, and we do uh, we are concentrated in low cost jurisdictions. Uh, one uh, feature uh, of the company uh, that I think is important to note is uh, our high degree of insider ownership. Uh, that ownership currently uh, sits at about 50 percent. On the financial highlights, uh, you'll see that uh, we have revenue before our Halix acquisition of about four hundred and forty million dollars in an EBITDA of 52 million annually or a 12 percent margin uh, we once we uh pro forma the halix extrusion dies acquisition that would take our revenue to approximately uh, a half a billion dollars uh, we do generate consistently strong free cash flow and we direct that cash flow to increasing our dividend over time which we've done 14 times in the last 13 consecutive years and we use the remainder to bolster our uh, already strong balance sheet and uh, to invest in growth uh, capex. Here on slide four, you can see our principal business segments. Uh, again, uh, the casting extrusion segment and automotive solutions. Casting and extrusion will grow to be about 50% of the overall revenue pie once we uh, layer in Halix here. And uh, as we'll get into uh, in a few slides, extrusion tooling primarily provides manufacturers uh, extrusion dies for the extrusion uh, aluminum end market. The large mold group uh, makes and rebuilds large high pressure die cast 
for uh, molds for the uh, automotive space. And Castool uh, serves both the extrusion and high pressure uh, die cast markets, and they make uh, proprietary supporting tooling and capital equipment that are used in both of those end markets. Our EBITDA margin of uh, 12% currently is uh, uh, certainly lower than uh, it has been in the past and, and lower than where we expect it will go in the future. Uh, these end markets uh, have been impacted adversely by the, uh, I'd call it recessionary conditions of the automotive uh, end market, whereby a vehicle production volumes have been adversely impacted by the chip, uh, microchip shortage uh, issue, uh, as well as uh, some inflationary pressures at, at the front end here. <clears throat> Page five shows our uh, global presence where, as I mentioned, we have 20 manufacturing locations. Uh, 16 of those are in the casting and extrusion segment and four are in the auto, uh, automotive solution segment. We're in nine countries and have 5,000 employees. Looking at the automotive solution segment, you can see here on slide six, uh, a couple of pictures as to some of the uh, products that we make. Uh, on the lower left-hand side is a cargo tray. Uh, it's effectively uh, a trunk mat that goes in the back of uh, SUVs. Uh, we sell uh, these uh, directly to the uh, OEMs and uh, we have a um, very high uh, market share uh, across our footprint in, in North America. Uh, the same goes with the uh, Nets, which is another uh, accessory type product that we sell, uh, whereby we have uh, a leading position in uh, the manufacture and uh, sales of, uh, of, of netting, you know, seat backs, uh, side pockets, uh, rear trunk, and um, Again, just a couple of uh, examples of the, the products that we sell. In the top, you can see uh, just a, a depiction of the interior of the vehicle. Here, we do a lot of uh, work with leather, uh, cutting, sewing, wrapping. Uh, we wrap uh, door bolsters, uh, center consoles. Uh, we uh, plastic injection mold and, and wrap uh, sun visors. As, and those are examples of some of the products that we provide uh, across um, pretty much all OEMs. <clears throat> Looking at the competitive strengths of our automotive solution segment, um, as I mentioned, we are the leading supplier of, uh, of netting and cargo trays, uh, but we do have a number of different uh, products. As I mentioned, we specialize in the manufacturing, cutting and wrapping of various interior trim components. Approximately 40% of our sales in this segment are to the OEM. So we're a tier one supplier and the remainder is primarily tier two. We do not uh, have any aftermarket uh, business here. We have uh, above market growth potential. So we are increasing our content per vehicle across the space. Historically, this has been driven by the uh, upsize of vehicles from sedans to SUVs and now, as we get into EVs, EVs have greater cabin and cargo space, which uh, is, is very well suited for the products that we sell. We did announce um, uh, several quarters ago that we are currently launching $65 million of new key programs between uh, the end of our fiscal 21, which ends in September, and fiscal 23. So we are uh, well underway with uh, launching these programs. And uh, they do include sizable content on new electric vehicle uh, commercial vans, but they do also include uh, sizable content across electric vehicles in, in general. Uh, we have a mix of, I guess what really drives the, uh, the growth in the profitability in this segment is our mix of highly innovative accessory and, and core parts. With respect to the accessory parts, uh, one trend to note is that OEMs have uh, been increasingly focused on improving their own profitability over the last few years by selling accessory products together with the vehicle at the time of purchase. In the past, uh, OEMs would have typically left the sale of various accessory products to third party uh, suppliers, which would was really sold through the dealer network. And as the AOEs uh, aim to capture uh, this, these sales directly 
Uh, that's opened the door up for innovative suppliers like Exco to uh, increase uh, our content per vehicle, which we are seeing uh, unfold. As I mentioned, uh, we've certainly uh, not been, um, or we, we have been impacted by uh, current market conditions in the automotive uh, end market, whereby uh, this uh, constrained supply of microchips has resulted in lower production uh, than uh, demand for vehicles uh, globally. And, uh, you know, the, the broader feeling is that uh, the chip supply issue is being uh, addressed. And as that occurs, uh, we do expect that uh, the production uh, of vehicles and the volume for Exco will increase uh, over the next few years. Looking at our casting and extrusion segment here on slide eight, we can see on the left-hand side, a large high pressure die cast mold and on the right, uh, an extrusion die as two principal uh, products that we sell in this segment. Uh, high pressure die cast uh, molds have historically been used for uh, making transmission uh, housings and engine blocks and more recently have been used to make structural components uh, across all vehicles. And this is occurring as OEMs aim to make vehicles lighter to reduce fuel consumption and reduce carbon dioxide uh, emissions. And, and together with the uh, growth in electric vehicles, uh, we really are just seeing um, heightened demand for uh, all kinds of aluminum going into the vehicle, both through the high pressure die cast process, but also through the uh, extrusions. And um, with respect to uh, these markets, uh, we have also really seen uh, just a, a great increase in the size and the complexity of all of the components that are going into the vehicle and the advanced tooling that's required in order to facilitate that. Tesla has been, um, an, uh, I guess, a, an early leader in not just moving to electric vehicles, but in using the high pressure die cast process to cast uh, products that uh, are much larger than anything in the past. Uh, they are, um, have ordered uh, large uh, 6,500 ton uh, high pressure die cast machines to basically build entire subframes of the vehicle using the high pressure die cast uh, process. Uh, we are also a leader in uh, 3D printing of tooling solutions for die cast. Here we uh, print some of the mold components with our proprietary 3D printing uh, process. And we did win a PACE award, which is a prestigious automotive news award uh, several years ago in recognition of our leading position. With respect to extrusion dies, um, this is a, a, an end market that uh, is, is quite diverse. In fact, it's largely non-automotive. Uh, building and construction is the biggest end market. And here we're seeing growth being driven by uh, in broader environmental sustainability trends. Uh, aluminum is, uh, has got properties that uh, are extremely green um, <clears throat> and uh, we're seeing a growth coming uh, from that end. In recognition uh, of that growth and in uh, recognition of our, our growth ambitions, uh, we did acquire Halix, again, the second largest manufacturer of extrusion dyes uh, in Europe. And we'll see those uh, results uh, once we uh, release our, our fiscal third quarter uh, at the end of July. We've been focused on uh, upgrading our equipment and uh, harmonizing our manufacturing processes across our various plants. Uh, we centralize certain functions. Uh, this keeps our, our quality consistent. It keeps our capacity high and it enables us to uh, meet the, uh, the short lead times that are required uh, by all customers. So we are a leader uh, in, in both of these end markets uh, and uh, we do see uh, significant growth uh, coming at us for the next uh, several years. Slide 10 uh, just depicts some of the various areas of the vehicle that uh, we are seeing uh, increased use of aluminum for. 
And again, this impacts both the demand for tooling for the extrusion and high pressure die cast uh, channels of our business. <laughs> Lastly, for me on slide 11 uh, is the uh, revenue path that we laid out to the market uh, several quarters ago. And uh, you can see the buildup of this growth profile, uh, which includes uh, organic activity from the build out of uh, two new plants in our cast dual uh, division. Uh, the Morocco plant became operational uh, in uh, early of our fiscal 2022, so November of 21, and the Mexico, uh, new Mexico facility is, is well underway. Uh, we also expect to have continuing content per vehicle growth uh, consistent with uh, our, our past, and uh, we do layer in the various uh, sizable programs, 65 million that uh, have been awarded. And so uh, I would say that we, you know, Halix will certainly uh, contribute to this growth. And with our very strong balance sheet and history of, of making uh, acquisitions, we expect uh, that there is further upside as well. With that, it uh, uh, concludes my uh, comments and uh, I will pass things over to Matthew to discuss the financial results. Great, thanks Darren. So moving along to slide 13, this is really looking at revenue by segment, uh, the automotive solutions versus the casting and extrusion. You can see automotive is, is higher uh, in historical purposes and uh, moving into our five-year projection or, or targets of 10% compound growth. Uh, they start getting a little closer. This does not reflect Halex uh, or, or other acquisitions. So. As Darren said, this year we expect to see it, it almost become 50-50. The growth from our current period uh, to our five-year period, it's a little bit stronger in the auto, or sorry, the casting extrusion segment. Uh, and this is because of the strong market demand that we see for aluminum and aluminum usage and automotive and other industrial segments. There's a lot of light weighting, as Darren mentioned, uh, and revolutionized manufacturing processes. So we see some significant growth in our casting extrusion group. The automotive section is seeing growth, obviously, and we see that from programs we're launching and continued growth of our content per vehicle. And the EBITDA segment, we have industry leading margins historically, even in the current period where I will say they're a little lower due to lower production volumes and the general economic uh, recessionary issues associated with semiconductors and so on, we still have strong margins. Our uh, five-year target does expect our margins to uh, normalize and we're confident that we'll get back to these levels with increased sales volumes uh, and manufacturing abilities. The net income, uh, the target is, is projecting an, an earnings per share of approximately $1.90 per share. Uh, that's up from, call it the trailing 12 months, 60 cents now or 98 cents. Again, right now things are uh, are down a bit, but uh, we we see the you know the future is, is bright with our expected expansion. So, discussing expansion, we talk about capital expenditures. In the current year, we anticipate uh, fixed asset expansion uh, capital expenditures of close to fifty five million. Forty three million of that will be in growth capex. Uh, we Darren already referenced our greenfield facility in Morocco. Uh, that was finalized in the first quarter of this year. Uh, our Mexican cast tool has, has started the building is well underway. Uh, we have some energy efficient and market leading heat treatment facilities we're putting in, both a new facility for cast tool and then upgrading equipment in our extrusion groups. The automotive segment has some growth capex uh, associated to new capex, uh, or sorry, new programs that we're launching to support those. Uh, we anticipate 2023 to probably be similar to the 2022 20, numbers. Uh, and then once some of this major growth starts to uh, get internalized, we'll see our CapEx go closer to, I'll call it normalized levels of 25 to 30 million uh, combination of, of growth and maintenance fixed acts, maintenance CapEx. Our dividend, Darren, always already referenced this, but we think this is a great graph to show that uh, our dividend was increased 5% in uh, February 2022, up to uh, 42 cents a share, but you can see the growth over the last uh, 13 years is, is very impressive and we are confident that will continue. 
Our balance sheet as of March 31st showed a very a neutral cash position. We have been sitting positive cash. Uh, obviously, with our fixed asset uh, strategy and growth strategy, we've been using that. Uh, we're quite pleased to have a neutral cash position. We have a $125 million committed revolver that matures in February 2025. We do not anticipate using all that. We use some of that for the uh, Halux acquisition. We have significant cushion in our bank uh, facility covenants, liquidity, uh, and, and um, our, our EBITDA has traditionally been strong, and we will continue to focus on keeping our cash, uh, our powder dry, and making sure we have a strong balance sheet and a good cash position. So uh, that kind of goes through the slide deck. We do have some questions. Uh, so we're going to take a second and kind of look out uh, at them. And, and Darren or I will try to, try to answer them probably just in order as they've been coming in. Sure. Uh, so it's Darren again. And I'll take uh, the first one. And um, uh, what percentage of cargo and netting are aftermarket? And has this changed over the years? Uh, as I mentioned, uh, we, we do not have any aftermarket um, uh, business within the automotive solution segment. And uh, there, there's also a related question about, um, you know, are you intending to pursue this market, the aftermarket? And we are not, uh, I think, you know, quite frankly, it's a different, um, it is a different market uh, segment that requires different skills and distribution channels and, uh, and the like. And, uh, we are focused on serving, uh, the, the OE, uh, and market currently, because that's where we think the growth is. Uh, again, the, the OEMs are, are really focused on capturing the sale of many of these products, uh, directly and, uh, rather than through, uh, the dealer network through third parties and, uh, we do see a lot of growth opportunity for us uh, by pursuing this strategy. Uh, so uh, that is uh, the reason why we are uh, sticking with um, our, our current uh, non-aftermarket uh, business. Um, have you been uh, impacted by any supply chain issues? And if you do, uh, do you see these issues continuing in the second half of the year? Uh, absolutely. Uh, I would say that um, operating uh, conditions have been uh, the most difficult um, in uh, probably uh, any time uh, for the automotive industry. Uh, this industry is typically a, a very well-oiled machine. And uh, with uh, the challenges of, uh, of, of shipping and uh, the availability of, of various components being constrained, uh, across the world, uh, we've had to do a lot of bobbing and weaving in order to satisfy the uh, order releases that uh, our customers require. Uh, the customer uh, order flow has been very erratic as well, uh, where orders have been put in the system one week and you gear up for production and then the orders get pulled. And so there's been a lot of uh, disruption to the operations and certainly the financial results as a result of this. And not to mention just the increasing uh, costs of, uh, of pretty much all inputs. Uh, I, I'd say that, you know, we, things have stabilized uh, with respect to those uh, factors in recent months. And uh, we may be starting to see uh, a slight improvement. It's difficult to project how uh, it will be sustained uh, on the near term basis, but uh, we've also seen uh, a reduction in commodity uh, prices. You just have to look at uh, the price of aluminum or, or copper or, or some of the global shipping rates and uh, there has been an improvement. And so we uh, are, I guess, hopeful that uh, that, that improvement will continue. Do you want to take that? Uh, I might add as well that um, the good news is on our supply chain, we have not been impacted significantly. So most of the issues uh, in terms of getting supplies and materials and parts to manufacture have been from our OEMs and uh, outside of us. So we've never had problems getting parts for our customers. If we've had to do some changes, we've been able to do it on the fly, but it's it's been more kind of macro on that one. Um, I'm going to go to uh, the growth drivers um, over the next 18 months. 
I think, uh, you know, Darren mentioned we have $65 million of, of uh, new program launches in the Automotive Solutions Group. Some of that, much of that has been launched this year. Uh, so being in the first year of launch, it won't be as impactful as it will down the road. Um, we have seen continued growth in some of our, with our extrusion facilities, some greenfield ones that have been started over the last couple of years are seeing uh, phenomenal growth and improvement. And then obviously the Halux acquisition will uh, be on there. And then uh, in the high pressure die cast group uh, with the changes to manufacturing and more and more companies moving in the direction of larger high pressure die casting, uh, we are seeing some, um, some demand for that area, you know, on top of our normal uh, components we, we have there. Yeah, and I guess I would just add that, uh, you know, we are, I think, uh, seeing at the early stages um, a trend to onshoring uh, again as supply chains uh, get shorter. And um, there's been a lot of uh, competition uh, for several of these products coming out of China and uh, from uh, far reaching uh, places of the globe. And uh, we, we think that we're very well uh, situated to benefit from. Uh, the onshoring trend, um, particularly in the in the high pressure diecast uh, mold part of the business, and that we should we should benefit from that. I guess uh, thoughts on your valuation and where, what are the catalysts for revaluation of the business? Uh, you know, I, I as a shareholder myself, I, I think that you know we are uh, undervalued, um, and I, I'd, I'd say that you know there's probably uh, there's probably kind of just a, a black cloud over the automotive space currently uh, because of the uh, production issues and, uh, and, and rising car prices and the like. But uh, the, the automotive industry is, is, is pretty resilient and demand for cars is uh, certainly not in question. You can see what's going on in the, the used car uh, pricing market. And uh, as as we execute on our five-year growth uh, target plan uh, and launch uh, the programs that we've been awarded, we uh, ramp up our greenfield facilities, we integrate uh, Halix, and we benefit from the continued movement toward uh, electric vehicles and broader environmental sustainability trends. Uh, I think it's I think it's going to become more evident that uh, Exco is. Uh, has got a more resilient business profile than uh, the general uh, parts provider uh, may have. Uh, this tooling business is is highly diversified. Uh, we're, we're leaders, and it has strong growth trends. And uh, in, in my mind, it's uh, it's a business that uh, you know should should be recognized with a with a higher valuation multiple than uh, we, we currently may be uh, being awarded. And I, I might add, if you look at the market and oh, from OEMs to other suppliers, um, I would say that everyone is being impacted similarly if you if you look at trends over the last six to 12 months. Um, so the valuation of the market, the share price isn't reflective of what we think the company's value is. It's as much as the industry trends right now. Is that it? Yeah. Okay, I think uh, that's all we're seeing on the uh, on the question front here. So uh, with that, I guess we can uh, thank uh, everyone for participating today. And uh, we'd uh, very much welcome um, any opportunities for, for further dialogue in a one-on-one in -on -one session. So just uh, reach out to uh, Matthew or myself or through the channels here with uh, virtual investor conferences. And thanks everyone for your time. Uh, we'll look forward to speaking to you again soon.